So uh, one realtor in the Bitterroot Valley says that when selling seasons are cut short because of fire, because of changes in fishing season and so forth, um, it really translates into a significantly diminished economy. So this is a business issue as well as a, a, a humane issue that we all care about um, as the climate uh, is changing in our environment. Tonight we have um, our topic is preparing for the road ahead with a community response to climate change. And I'm thrilled to introduce Jill Alvin, who is the outreach coordinator for the Clark Fork Coalition, who, which I'm sure many of you are aware that the Clark Fork Coalition has been working hard for many years to protect the water resources and the whole uh, Clark Fork water <coughs> and other resources as well. Jill directs um, the um, uh, Engage program, which is the outreach programs of the Clark Fork Coalition. That includes volunteer events, workshops, learning activities, continuing education courses, youth courses, and climate change activities. So Jill is actually on um, the City of Missoula's Climate Action Task Force, which is about City of Missoula planning for climate change. But she's also, and what she's going to talk with us about, the director or, or one of the key leaders of uh, a coalition, which is a community-wide response to climate change, um, uh, an adaptation, climate adapt adaptation working group for our, our, our greater region. Um, she also is clearly a nature lover. She's on the um, she's the president of the Rattlesnake Rattlesnake Creek Watershed Group, um, and she's on the board for the Clark Fork uh, Market. And we all love those things too. So I'm delighted to introduce to you Jill Alvin. So I'm glad the mic's not working. I really don't like microphones. But can everyone hear me? Yeah, everyone hear me? OK. Um, so thanks again for having me and uh, coming and attending. This is a great group, um, great numbers. And I'm curious to hear where folks are coming from. Um, how many local business owners do we have? Or OK. And then it looks like we have a fair number of students. OK. Folks from conservation organizations. Okay, social services, okay, good, yeah, so a mix. So maybe just like 30 seconds, let's spout off why we're interested in this issue. So maybe we could hear from someone from the business community. Why is climate change important to you? Who's gonna go? Or I'm gonna call on John. I, I can't, uh, no. I can't. No? <laughs> Take an hour. Are you gonna do your job? <laughs> I mean, I have a nine-year-old and a seven-year-old. Great. <laughs> so taking ahead to their lives, what their quality of life would be like. Okay. How about some of the students? Why are you interested in climate change or here tonight? This is a good path uh, in career options. Mm -hmm. uh, ah. Doing sustainable business. Okay. Great. Yeah. I think climate change just affects so many things that we all love about this community. It mm -hmm. has such a deep relation to the nature. It's important to take care of it for its sake and for ours. Yeah. Other folks? We had some people from the conservation community. Systems collapse. Systems collapse. That's your driving, that's your motivating factor. Yeah. <coughs> it's awfully global. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I'm interested in I'm interested in local localization. Okay. Great. Local, local solutions. Okay. <coughs> Great. Anybody else want to share why they came tonight? Okay. Um so what I've prepared, uh, as, as Jenny referenced um, a few weeks ago, actually it was close to a month ago now, uh, a, a select group of folks, an organizing committee, worked to put together a community climate summit for Missoula. And this was an invitation event. Um, we worked hard to identify decision makers, movers and shakers in the community um, who we thought could really contribute to a cross-sector discussion on climate change. and. Um, the event was extremely successful. It was on September 25th. We brought over 100 people together. Um, I was personally just very pleased with the number of folks we had in attendance and um, blown away by the response and the willingness of folks to participate in this kind of conversation. Before I get to that part tonight, what I wanted to do is provide a little bit of context insofar as 
uh, why the Clark Fork Coalition is choosing to work on climate change outreach and some of the efforts that occurred leading up to the summit. You know, it didn't just happen out of nowhere. There were some contributing factors. Um, also, this I want to be pretty informal, so if people have questions or comments or things they want to add, please just <coughs> shout it out, raise your hand, whatever's easiest for you. That's fine. Am I going the right way? The other way. <laughs> okay, so climate change. Um, and, and, and we've referenced this already in the, in the conversation, but stands to have tremendous impacts on our way of life here in Western Montana. Impacts to agriculture, natural resources, local economies, recreation. So why is the Clark Fork Coalition so interested in this? Why have we been working on climate change outreach? Um, we, our mission at the Clark Fork Coalition is the restoration and protection of the Clark Fork watershed which, um, as you can see here, forms the headwaters, the northern headwaters of the Columbia River system. It's, it's a critical water system. Um, we are a headwater state, so protection of water quality is really important here um, in western Montana. It's uh, a 22,000 square mile area with over 350,000 miles of rivers. So the coalition's uh, mission is threefold. One is protection. We work to uh, protect the river, um, to identify potential threats to water quality, water quantity, clean, abundant water, and to work um, to, to mitigate for those threats through a variety of efforts, including advocacy and outreach. We also have a vibrant restoration program. Um, how many folks have been over to the Milltown area recently? Yeah, pretty amazing restoration story right in the backyard of Missoula. The Milltown Dam, which blocked the confluence of the Clark Fork and Blackfoot Rivers for years, has been removed. Um, and tons of contaminated sediment that had piled up behind that dam are now gone. Um, now we're, we're looking ahead to the upper Clark Fork where there's a lot of restoration work still to be done. And we, we have five folks now working primarily in the field on restoration efforts. And I can talk more about that if people have questions, but. I do. Yes. Uh, can you explain the um, definition of the upper Clark Yes. Yep. Thank you. Um, is from the Clark Fork headwaters. Does anyone know which two creeks form the headwaters of the Clark Fork? Uh, Silver Bow. Silver Bow. Silver Bow. And Warm Springs. Springs. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, so with the, where those two creeks come together, the confluence of those two creeks is the beginning of the Clark Fork, and then the upper Clark Fork is defined until where the Milton Dam used to be, the confluence of the Blackfoot and the Clark Fork Rivers. That area is the largest Superfund site in the country. Um, there has, you know, decades of, of mining pollution and damage. Um, that Superfund complex was broken up into three distinct areas. The Milltown cleanup, which has finished. The Silverbow cleanup, which is also complete. And now there's um, close to 50 river miles on the main stem in between. That, that cleanup has just commenced this year. So, I, I'm sorry to yeah, ask yeah. you questions, but um, I, I'm think preemptively mm -hmm. and also historically yep. to draw from history. Mm -hmm. So what were the causes of that pollution? Yep. So Butte, America, the city of Butte, um, was the richest town on earth, right, for, for years and years, provided, you know, copper munitions essentially fueled World War II to an extent, right, the <laughs> allied effort. Um, Back before stringent environmental laws were in place, um, there were repeated pollution problems um, because of mining, and flood events sent a number of tailings downstream. Um, those tailings piled up behind Milltown Dam and also were deposited in the floodplain and riverbanks of the Clark Fork River, creating what are essentially dead zones. They're called slickens. Um, which is just, it's just contaminated areas of ground. So through the Superfund cleanup, they're going to cart all of that out and um, restore the, the riverbank and floodplain. But the, but the pollution is both airborne and waterborne? No, it's, it's, a, it's a waterborne pollution. Yep. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Okay. 
Uh, so the third um, aspect of our programs is engaged. This is, this is our, our newest program area. This is our education and outreach initiatives. So the Clark Fork Basin is a big place, and we need to connect people with the ongoing recovery, with the story of our waterways. Um, we can't do it alone. So we at the Clark Fork Coalition, we really see climate change as, as something that impacts all of our works. Um, it has the potential to reverse decades of restoration gains, the cleanup that, ha that has happened by ex exacerbating issues. Um, it is another threat to clean and abundant water, and um, it also holds economic threats for local communities who depend on rivers as community assets. So um, in 2008, it's been over five years, uh, we commenced our climate action in the Clark Fork program with the release of a report called Low Flows Hot Trout. And uh, we did a, a lot of outreach surrounding this report. Um, and essentially, what, what the, the reason that I feel that the report was successful is that we, we didn't talk about the origins of climate change, the, the, the human-caused nature of climate change. We, just, we didn't sort of dive into that. What we did was look at 50 years of data and observations and how we are seeing change in the Clark Fork watershed. Um, shifts in stream flow, changes in runoff, changes in precipitation, changes in temperature. Um, we rolled out this information nationally and regionally and opted to focus um, on a, a, a more regional outreach effort um, to, to, to prepare for um, the impacts of what the data was showing. So this in turn, um, all the outreach surrounding our 2008 report led to a community workshop that we co-hosted back in 2011. So this was prior even to this year's summit where um, we brought folks together to talk about uh, what they valued about living in this community and strategies for preparing um, for the expected impacts of climate change. So the first question for those participants and questions I think for, for everyone when we begin to think about these, these issues are what matters most? So I'll just ask the room. Um, why do you live here? Why do you have your business here? Why have you chosen to to dwell here, have your family here in western Montana, Missoula County. It can be... Accessibility to the outdoors. Yeah. Sense of community. Sense of community. Mm -hmm. Close Others? Close to Glacier. Close to Glacier, yeah. <laughs> the university. The university. Yeah. The beauty of the community. Mm -hmm. So these, what you've all just said, were, were echoed by the, by the folks in the attendance. High quality of life, natural resources, um, and, that, and that sort of intangible sense of community that came up in those discussions as well. Local food, people really like local food, local markets. Um, so then we looked at, uh, at that workshop, we looked at what the science is telling us. Um, again, Western Montana expected to get warmer and is, is, has gotten warmer from 1950 on. Um, so this graph is showing uh, average air temperature from 1950 to 2006 with a near two degree increase in Missoula. Um, annual snowfall over the past 50 years or so are show, it, is, is a decrease. So the, the climate change precipitation models, you know, are, uh, the, the, the scenarios are, are variable, right? But, but one thing that's kind of constant is that uh, more precipitation is falling as rain instead of snow. Total precipitation models kind of vary, but the snow pack on average on April 1st has decreased by 30% in the past 50 years. In the past five. 50 years. Um, so changes in snowpack lead to, and less snowpack lead to changes in flows. Um, so earlier runoff typically with decreased snowpack, and that's been witnessed as well. This is a chart showing runoff on the on the Blackfoot River. Um, the green is in 2007, and you can see it's earlier than the average period of record there. Um, Warmer stream temperatures on average. This, this data is from Rock Creek, which is a blue ribbon trout stream, for those of you that like to trout fish. And I know I do. And, and when you see the, the, the purple color there is showing more days um, of higher stream temperatures over 70 degrees. And those warmer temperatures favor non-native species, typically brown trout, um, as opposed to our native trout species. 
So, so back to the workshop, folks had a chance to look at the science and you know, all of this is available on our website and I did bring a couple copies to share. I'm going to stay away from that <laughs> speaker. Um, but what was really interesting is folks had a chance to look at socio and economic data as well. We had a partner in play, um, Headwaters Economics, who prepared um, a look at uh, the economy of Missoula County. I find this research to be really valuable. I continue to use this in my work today, so I'm happy to share this link with folks. Um, but just a few snapshots that, that kind of stand out. Um, Service-related occupations, so essentially occupations not having to do with farming, mining, construction, a couple others, make up the majority of our jobs here in Missoula County. Um, 18 individuals, the status from 2010, 18 individuals, 18% 18 of individuals are below the poverty line. 23% of individuals in 2010 had no health insurance. Another interesting piece when thinking about adapting to changes is that over half of the land in Missoula County is under federal or state management. So that's going to require an intense amount of collaboration in preparing. Um, so vulnerabilities, economic vulnerabilities identified through this process. Again, that high quality of life, the, the reason that we're, that we're living here could be at risk. Um, impacts to the service-related industry, which again make, over, make up over 70% of jobs in Missoula County. Um, higher energy and food prices anticipated to have impacts locally. Um, water vulnerability, invasive species, um, which invasive species stand to have ecologic as well as economic impacts as well. So major risks identified by the community at that time were um, Species shifts, wildfire, drought, no water in the streams, flooding, shifts in runoff timing, and then the local impact of global change. People kind of picked up on this idea of climate refugees and thinking about climate change as a, as a growth issue as well, that you know this is already a very desirable place to live, and as different areas of the country become less desirable, is it going to make Western Montana even more so than it already is? So, so keep quiet to your friends about <laughs> so the group had over 100 recommended actions, um, and those th those actions, you know, the, again, this was put together in 2011, are being implemented today to a degree. Um, things that stand out, you know, especially in the, in the water realm, which is what I'm most familiar with, um, there are the Clark Fork Coalition has a robust in-stream flow restoration program. The U.S. Forest Service, the Clark Fork Coalition, and some, some private contractors have been partnering on an ongoing watershed vulnerability assessment on the low, low national forest. So taking a look at which tributary streams, which creeks might be most vulnerable to um, decreased flows, decreased precip, and, and this overall scenarios that are anticipated, and then that info can be used to inform management strategies. So, in those researches, are they also measuring toxins such as you know mercury levels and things like that? You know, I'm not sure. Um, I'd ha I'd have to look into that. If if it's not a part of that particular study, I'm I'm imagining that that would be layered on, okay. you know, in the ultimately to inform those management decisions. But I'm, I'm not sure if it's part of the vulnerability assessment. I believe that more has to do with stream temp, flow, yeah, quantitative data like that. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna keep plugging away here. So um, after that workshop, that, which was in 2011, um, in, in early 2012, the Clark Fork Coalition, you know, we sat with our report of recommended strategies and actions, which are here and also available on our website, and thought, okay, so where do we go from here? We have 100 plus strategies recommended by, from the community. A lot of these are already ongoing. A lot of these projects are already underway. There are adaptation initiatives underway. There are mitigation strategies at local government levels. Like, how can we begin to begin coordinate these efforts and, and, and enhance what's going on, share learning? So we identified the, the, first, the first next step as um, bringing together representatives from programs and projects that were ongoing. So um, we formed what we call the ADAPT Working Group. And it's made up of close to 12 individuals representing various sectors in our community. Um, we have a representative from the Forest Service, um, uh, local conservation groups, Montana Audubon, um, Alternative Energy Resources Organization, the City of Missoula, um, 
Community Food and Agriculture Coalition. We have a local landowner. This group was formed at the outset as a peer learning network. So a place where folks can come together, talk about climate change, talk about communication strategies around climate change. What's working kind of from that broader perspective and so far as, okay, what's the reception to the work that you're doing? How, what, what are your challenges? Where are your roadblocks? And, and, and sharing info and, and, and trying to move things forward. We talk a lot about fundraising and, and trying to garner money in the group. Um, it became pretty obvious as the year progressed that people really wanted to sink their teeth into something more and really just keep, keep moving a lot of things forward, implement even more ideas from the community report, but also to engage others that weren't in the room. And that's been you know, definitely a challenge from a climate change planning perspective is engaging quote unquote non-traditional allies. Um, so folks who maybe climate change planning isn't in the lexicon, isn't in sort of the, the driving motivation behind strategic plans or, or um, you know, the, their goal setting for the, for the year or coming year. So how do, we, how do we get more of this outreach out there? So we landed on the Missoula Community Climate Summit. And so I want to kind of stop here and spend some time and, and maybe go back and forth with, with you guys a little bit. But um, there, were some, there were a lot of motivations going into, going into this. Um, one, is, one was we wanted to, to broadcast, to showcase these ongoing efforts, adaptation, mitigation, to the larger community. There's a lot going on. Um, you know, as anyone who lives in Missoula knows on any given weekend or weeknight like tonight. Um, there are volunteer opportunities, there are workshops, there are learning activities, and many of those are sustainability, oriented around sustainability. So how do we you know, bring all that together, showcase what's going on, um, maybe begin to share resources, leverage some activities to help others? So, so that was definitely one motivating factor behind, behind the summit is bring folks together from different sectors, different industries across the community and share what's going on. The second was um, to provide a space for people to share ideas, in, again, in that cross-sector format. So um, this deliberative dialogue model listed there has been modeled at the University of Montana. Um, and I should pause here and say that I, I by no means was working alone on this effort. Um, the ADAPT working group is, is a phenomenal group of folks. Um, and my, my co-leader in, in this was Amy Sillenberg from Montana Audubon and Nikki Fear from the University of Montana. And Nikki has modeled campus conversations around climate change. She's hosted two of those. And she shared her deliberative model with us. So basically, and, we, and I know we have a couple folks here who participated in the day, but um, people had an opportunity um, to sit at a table with a moderator and share their big idea for climate change and to kind of go around in a circle um, and, and work off of each other. Um, the, the second piece I want to speak to is, uh, was, the, was the invite, invite portion because not only did we want to share learning, but we wanted to inspire action. So action requires action makers, decision makers, people who, who have the ability to, to influence the community, to make decisions, to, you know, to, to shift things forward. So we, we tried to be very strategic about putting an invite list together and thinking about the best ways to get those movers and shakers in the room. So thankfully, this effort um, was our, our brainstorming around this planning process was simultaneously occurring right around when the city of Missoula passed its uh, conservation and climate action plan for municipal operations. So the city's mitigation plan, their plan to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And the mayor has been you know, tremendously supportive of climate action planning um, and has been on board from the start and has always been interested too in the, in the fate, what he calls the phase two, the next step in bringing this out to the community. So we were able to partner with the mayor and utilize his influence to invite a lot of really great people to the summit and we had over a hundred people there this year um, and I know we had a, we have a couple folks here who were there that day so if you guys want to share your experience that would be great so it's not just me talking about it um, but the in the in the feedback we've received since the event a lot of you know when we asked well why did you come you know why did you want to come and talk about climate change and they said I was invited I was invited by someone I knew by a, by a colleague that I respect the mayor invited me you know the 
my, my friend at the university invited me. You know, so, it's, so again, it's this, okay, so if we create that space, if we, if we ask people to participate in the dialogue, maybe it's not so hard in a sense. Um, so, I, yeah. I just want to speak to that creating the space. Mm -hmm. where I was a note taker for that. Oh, time. yeah. Um, and it really did just bring anyone who, you know, is kind of timid about the climate change and deal with either a business aspect or just a community aspect. Mm -hmm. And creating that space was really inviting to them to come and speak or come and just listen as well. So I. Good. I'm glad. Oh, thank you. <laughs> you look familiar. Now I know why. <laughs> Great. Thank you. So I created this little, I did this this afternoon, I created this little tag cloud because, well, there's a lot of data to go through and a lot of information to go through following the summit. Um, we have over 50 pages of notes from all the different tables with everyone's ideas for action. Um, and, and priorities they've emphasized and wh where they want to see, see our community energy focused. And our organizing committee is, is trying to go through a very mindful process of organizing that information and, and, and then reflecting that back at the attendees and determining next steps. But I started here um, just with some bi you know, big emerging themes you know, that, that popped out from this. Um, Big ideas. Folks had the chance to share their big ideas, which was, sort of ran the gamut between we need more education on climate change, we need to, we need to get our youth involved, um, to we need a more robust recycling program, we need renewable energy sources. Transportation was huge. You know, lots of tables, people talked about transportation solutions. The mountain lion levy came up. Um, the two exciting pieces for me are at the top there, we had over 120 folks in attendance and 70 people want to stay involved in community response to climate change. So now is the hard part. <laughs> so like I mentioned, we have an incredible amount of information um, from, from this summit. More big ideas, you know. Big ideas that are similar to the community recommendations that came out of the ClimateWise report, but are also much different too. And because of the folks that were there, again, we had leaders in economic development, business leaders, university agency folks, et cetera. There is a little bit more of an economic emphasis in some of the ideas, um, which will be interesting to dive into. So the, we've decided to, that the, the best step moving forward is going to be to create a website. To, to house all of this information, um, as opposed to putting together a, another report, you know, where a document is can be sort of inherently hierarchical, you know, with this comes first, this comes second, and that it's, I think it's important not to reflect that sense, but to to have everything sort of out in the open and let a user explore. We're also going to be doing a very very short post survey, asking people specifically what climate action projects you are working on and who you're working with. And then our group is going to work to create a visual. So kind of similar to that tag cloud, really show the projects that are really big right now and who's working on them to sort of let that network, that, that network of folks, sort of emerge organically. At least that's the hope. <laughs> Need people to respond to that quick survey first. Um, because it's, it's tricky, right? I mean, this is community organizing. This is how do you move things forward. And so we want, it, we want to begin working on projects and begin implementing big ideas, but that, that core organizing part moving forward, that, that vision for the community is important too. So um, we think we need to meet again. So, <laughs> but this, this time we're, we're going to be um, organizing more of a social you know, kind of similar to tonight, probably won't even be quite as formal as tonight, um, where we'll begin to talk about next steps and what, what, this, what this might look like. You know, how will we organize work on some of these projects um, and how will we enhance this network moving forward. So that, yep, yeah, I'm going to stop there. Yes. And I'm sorry if I went too long. <coughs> I think I would, oh, there it is. Hi. So thank you, Will, for that wonderful um, explanation of all the work that's been done to date. The way these shots are designed is to have a, a shot of, uh, you know, narrow uh, concentration of information and then Q&A discussions. So this is the discussion time. So I'm sure there's lots of things 
floating around in your heads, and I'm sorry I didn't talk to you earlier, but we'd love to hear from you. What are your questions and comments? This is a lot of shots. Yeah. <laughs> one of the things I liked about the one of the things I liked about the the conference was that you guys rigged the game, <laughs> and you set certain people at certain tables. Yeah. So there was a real broad uh, cross section at mm -hmm. each table: people from government, people from environment, people from business. And I'm just wondering if you're going to be doing this network building, how do you keep that happening so people don't just go to their little corner of the room and, and you know, not pay attention to the other stuff? I think that is a huge question. Um, and I don't exactly have an answer for you, except to say that I, I really think this, the structure moving forward is going to be important. Um, and I am an action-oriented person. You know, I, I just I like to just get things done, move forward, boom, boom, boom. But if we start spinning and going on different projects and people working on specialized things that they know a lot about, you know, that that sort of that that momentum and that a little bit of that energy and that sharing, the commun the, the that community sharing piece is lost. I agree with you. So I don't I, I don't have a a system I can share with you that we're going to utilize right at present, but the, these are definitely things that we're thinking about. Yeah. Might I ask how many people attended the original one? The original, the climate summit, the the month ago was, yep, yeah, about a hundred. A month ago, I think she said, yeah, about a hundred and twenty. Jenny, would you have the people who ask questions use the mic? Um, Jill is actually mic'd for MCAT, okay. but nobody else is. So if they use that mic, then MCAT will pick up their question. And what that means is that to ask a question, you need to come up here so that you can get right. But I love, it's not that hard. I can help because I have the free area. Okay. So who would like to contribute a comment or question? Well, I have would, would you come up? It's going to give feedback. Yeah, yeah, you just have to. Emily, we're in a nice safe space. Just pop up and say, so if you're far enough away, it's probably okay to come up. You just need to be far enough away from the We're just in the living room. It's just us. Two questions. Yeah. Why don't we switch? Education. What's being done in the in the school system? since I think that, that educating mm -hmm. the youngest children uh, about climate change and, yeah. and uh, is so important. Mm -hmm. And the other is, is, is there any effort to try and see what other communities are doing yeah. so we don't try and reinvent the wheel? Because I know there's some great efforts on some other yep. communities out there. Yep. Great questions. Um, I'll answer the second one first. We are doing research on what other communities are up to and in fact, in preparation for the summit, we produced a resource guide that did offer um, just kind of a snapshot of what some different communities are up to, especially across the West. And we're going to continue to, to enhance that on the website. So I think the website is a, is a good place to, to house a lot of that information and update it. Um, because I agree with you, you know, and on the one hand, we're, I think we're special here and we like to think of ourselves as special and unique and no one maybe can tell us how to do things, right? Or maybe that's the sentiment, but, um, and it does need to be a locally driven effort, but there are invaluable lessons learned, you know, out there and communities that are similar to ours, you know, in demographics and location. Um, education, I also agree, you know, it is big and I know that there are efforts and specifically, you know, certain teachers that are really working on um, infusing their science curriculum with some, with some climate change awareness and education activities. Um, but I, I am not familiar with, with any planned effort. I do know that the public schools are currently, I think they're looking at their standards right now. Is anyone involved in public school education? Or I think, I think they're looking at, they're doing like a five-year planning process at present. Um, and they're, they're definitely listed as a group to, to engage with. Yeah, and there are other conservation organizations. I know, like for example, the Watershed Education Network in town that um, they've been looking into some climate change education models as well. More questions? 
Yeah, come come stand by me. Okay. <laughs> right here. First off, I want to say thank you to the Clark Fork Coalition oh, thank you. for keeping this alive. Thanks. Secondly, um, I would like to ask, has there been in the other localities around the country that mm -hmm. you're aware of mm -hmm. who are also addressing this issue um, an acknowledgement that perhaps Montana communities mm -hmm. such as Missoula mm -hmm. are in a preservation mode of what we have versus those communities who have already had significant degradation mm -hmm. of their environment mm -hmm. that it makes it to me it makes it two different scenarios mm -hmm. to address mm -hmm. is that, is and that so your question that? is do other communities recognize our position or where we're yes, coming from right that Missoula could actually be a prototype for mm -hmm. um, how to preserve what they have yeah. versus have to go to the point at which degradation has occurred mm -hmm. and now yeah you know, I'm not sure. I think we'd have to reach out to other communities and survey them and ask them what their perception of our community is. But I agree with you that this is a tremendous opportunity for our community to really model some some solutions, you know, to try things out, to wade the waters, to see what works, see what doesn't work. Um, and, and, and there's opportunity for us to, to showcase the work that we're doing while we're doing it so that others can okay. learn and we can function in a leadership role. And also role. From, from a leadership role within the national context yeah. is what I'm saying. Yeah. I, th I think there's so. room for that. Yeah. This isn't exactly a question. It's more like a comment. Yeah. Having lived here a long time ago mm -hmm. and then returned recently, um, the sense of community continues. Mm -hmm. It's even stronger now um, because there are a lot of people here who probably have only moved here in the last 20 years. And as Rebecca mentioned, we haven't seen, quote, the degradation maybe that mm -hmm. some communities have only because we are so caught up in our nostalgia and our history and our love of community. Um, there are dozens upon dozens of active con conservation groups in this area. My first thought was herding cats, trying to get us the groups who all have a vision for what they think needs to be done mm -hmm. to coalesce and come together in a unified manner mm -hmm. kind of undermines the concept of organic. Mm -hmm. um, the idea that when we talk about being organic versus contrived, I'm probably using the wrong the word in a way that may seem pejorative, but I'm not intending mm -hmm. it as such. But when we start to impose our structures and not allow for the organic Again, it's that hurting cats thing. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping that whether it's the mayor, whether it's uh, this, you know, what other form can be most useful. This would be a useful form: sustainability, you know, a business community trying to get an umbrella that recognizes what the big picture is mm -hmm. and how many groups are already working toward that. Mm -hmm. And I know I'm rambling, but the idea is trying to bring together an umbrella yeah. where we can actually get a structure going. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Your comment makes me think of a couple of things. It makes, makes me think of Transition Town, right, and their, their efforts and everything they've been striving toward. And also the, 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 that we're trying to preserve what we have. And it is interesting to think about, especially in, from the perspective of the Clark Fork River, how much that river has been through. And Missoula, used, you know, we used to turn our backs from the river. The river was a dump. You know, there were periods when it ran red. 
and and it, it that has turned around. You know, businesses clamor to be by the river. You know, the Clark Fork River Market wanted to be next to the river. The river is on the rebound. So at the same time, there's this really remarkable example in our backyard of we have made something better together as a community. Well, I have a comment. Mm -hmm. um, I, I was privileged to attend this uh, summit as a moderator. And um, in addition to working with the SBC here in Missoula, I'm working with a startup in Colorado that is um, has basically stopped everything else. It's a food system startup. It um, develops uh, resources for food shed um, supply chain development for um, uh, across the country, really, but based on what they've learned in Colorado. And in their case, they really had to stop everything they were doing on developing local food businesses and financing sources for local food businesses and so forth to create a um, disaster relief fund because the flooding that happened produced so much damage to farmland and irrigation canals in particular. And so one of the things, they've been working for um, over a, a decade there, building multi-stakeholder uh, support for developing the food system in a sustainable way and locally. And I could talk a lot more about that, but the point is, is that once this flood came, they realized that they not only had to really rely heavily on the stakeholder network that they had built, but they needed a whole lot of new relationships that they hadn't built with dozens of canal companies, for example, because the ditches are owned by different groups and so forth. So um, this is a, a nearby state um, example of why creating a foundation of multi-stakeholder relationships is in itself creating a resiliency mm -hmm. for the community and our sense of community here in Missoula is part of what allows us to do this mm -hmm. um, and maybe perhaps to speak to Rebecca's mm -hmm. request part of what we can model for, for other communities. Yeah, maybe. yeah that's, that's great. Great. So um, I almost didn't raise my hand because this microphone is way too dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So first of all, I just have a comment. Um, it's really amazing to attend a talk like this because I've been taking a class at the university from Nina Asma, and I'm sure many of you know her, and it's called Community and Environment. And um, I just love how the concept and the principle of this talk is how we're you know, negotiating, working through a challenge as a community. Mm -hmm. Because a community, as a definition, is a set of people that are interdependent upon each other and they have common goals. Mm -hmm. And opening you know, a forum for communication where non-traditional allies can get together, realize that common goal, and then work in civic capacity to make things possible is just incredible. We've been living through it, not me. <laughs> But so many people have been living here for so many years. We know Ms. Willa best. We care about Ms. Willa most. We are the people as a community that will make the most tangible difference. Mm -hmm. So, incredible talk. I just want to say that. Oh. And then, <laughs> <laughs> um, so something you touched on that I'm super interested in that is very close to my heart is youth environmental education. Mm -hmm. And I actually do work with MUD and their youth education program. Mm -hmm. And in my curriculum, we don't discuss it, it, not directly, we don't have a direct curriculum for mm -hmm. climate change. Mm -hmm. We need to talk about it inadvertently. Mm -hmm. um, and I've also volunteered with WEN, so mm -hmm. as a school stream monitor, and, uh, and they don't have anything that directly addresses climate change either. So do you think it'd be possible to sit down and speak with both organizations about the community that you, or about the information that you've gathered and mm -hmm. maybe have them collaborate on teaching those lessons to children? Because they're, they're the most important audience we can have. Yeah. yeah, I think that's a great idea. Um, and we should stay in touch we and should. try to figure out how to move Seriously, some of this I would, forward. I would, I would love to see yeah. some more climate change curriculum. Yeah, and yeah. And I think, you know, I think the, the, it's very important to involve administrators and teachers, right, and think about their standards and their set of goals and how, you know, how to work in the system and, and, and fulfill the needs that they have right. while you know, introducing what can be, a, you know, political and inflammatory topic. So, you know, things like introducing surveys of teachers first to sort of figure out, okay, so what exactly is happening first? And then sort of taking that to inform some next steps could be, these yeah. are just ideas, but Love yeah. Yeah, yeah, great, great. 
We've had a brave model of how to brave the microphone. It's available to anybody who would like it next. Great, Claudia. I'm, I'm a little uh, leery of that microphone. <laughs> <laughs> it works right here. It's okay. Fine. okay. Uh, one very concrete way for ordinary folks to network, especially in uncertain times, is the time bank. Uh, Transition Missoula and Jeanette Rankin Peace Center have started a time bank. I think it was late June or July, and it's up and running. If you Google MissoulaTimeBank.org, it costs $25 to join if you have the money. If you don't have the money, it's uh, volunteer three hours to the time bank. And then you put in the, the computer what you're offering, whether it's um, uh, cleaning somebody's house, doing uh, yard work, uh, uh, offering counseling, offering computer work. Uh, I, I put in my jam and relish that I make. And then you look down and see what's offered. And uh, I got a, a gal to come and help me clean my patio and my windows that had been waiting for a long time. Uh, um, uh, another person is offering acupuncture. So, um, and, and it really has had a good response, but what it needs is more people to actually use it, to actually, uh, you know, put in what you are offering and actually, uh, you know, use some of what's offered. Uh, and uh, I might mention too that uh, you get a free hour for joining. Oh. Great. Well, that's another example of how Missoula is connected um, and, and building community and creating exchange. Because this is the Sustainable Business Council and um, the economic uh, implications kind of came to the fore in, as one of the kind of key themes. I would like to just see if there are any business people or people who would like to uh, speak from a more of a business perspective about anything about how this affects your business, what your concerns are, how you'd like to see this go forward. I'm putting you on the spot. It's an invitation, not a requirement. Do we have one? Great. I, I, oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We have not terrified the audience. <laughs> I am really glad to talk into this for two. It's a new mic. Yeah, so please stand over here. You can stand by me. Stand by her. Yeah. Come over here, so you don't get on the glare. I'm so, sorry. <laughs> so I just think, from an economic standpoint, that as um, we continue to model ourselves as a community that's on the forefront of addressing the potential adaptation and mitigation issues, that we're going to be able to somehow moderate this mass population growth that you were talking about. I don't know if you guys are aware of that, but the fact that the Rocky Mountains are supposed to triple in size with impending climate change, right? Because people are gonna move here. We have space and clean water, right? So I think as the more that we model the ability to own our own water company, provide our own energy, grow our own food, develop our own economy that's relying on local resources, I think that we're gonna be able to sort of um, move into the 21st century with these climate change challenges more thoroughly. That's what my read is on it. And I okay. thank you for the work you're doing. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lisa. I promise I won't turn on the microphone. <laughs> that helps us stay awake. <laughs> I can move this around. Yeah, all you have to do is hug Jill. You, you will be heard. I'll be on the mic. So, it's a new mic, so, I'm sorry. We're just getting used to it. So thank you everyone for coming. I hope you will all stay tuned um, as this uh, you know, really um, innovative and cutting edge work continues to unfold. Um, probably the website will be a great way to do that. I want to um, say a deep thanks to Jill for coming today. Give you a, um, Ooh. Oh, a, a thank gift, you. which is a, a tote bag from uh, the SBC. Thank, thank you so much. Community, so um, 
um, please stay tuned. Uh, remember, November 5th is our um, next sustainability shot. Please um, support our sponsors and uh, look forward to seeing you at the next one. Eat more food. There's more food and drink. Stay, talk, discuss. I left some cards Thank over you. on the counter if anyone wants to grab a card and give me a call. Jill's cards are on the counter. Uh,